gone to uh, Los Alamos. And then he decided that like, the weather there was too warm, he moved up to uh, Penn State for many, many years. <laughs> and so uh, he, he saw the errors of the ways and moved down to a third tech started a new institute, which is the Center for Relative Capital. And so today, how we talk about uh, stuff that he's been working on with various collaborators uh, on light shows from two matters. Thank you very much for the invitation. So, uh, uh, my collaborators are Tanya Bader, who's a postdoc at uh, Georgia Tech, Tamara Bogdanovich, that she's uh, an Einstein Fellow in Maryland, Ronald Hess, and uh, Dara Shoemaker. So, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, some of the new directions that numerical relativity has taken recently. As uh, you know, most of the time, most of the, in the previous years, numerical relativists have been worried with the problem of solving the two-body problem in general relativity. The main driving force there is the connection with gravitational wave astrophysics and uh, with the observational effort led by LIGO and collaborators. Well, now that we're capable of doing that in a reasonable way, it has opened the possibility to other uh, avenues of research. And one of them is, that is a natural one, which is that uh, to add something to the right-hand side of Einstein equations. That is to add matter, and uh, the matter it comes in different flavors. You can have gas and dust, magnetic fields, or t uh, you can even have just uh, collisionless particles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to go, there is uh, now uh, uh, significant work in these directions. I'm going to try to summarize briefly what has been done. And I'll concentrate in the following problem. That is of two black holes, uh, supermassive black holes, merging in this environment that is a gas cloud. And I'll elaborate a little bit about how realistic this is, or what are the future directions, or what is the implications, astrophysical implications in this case. So, but first, you know, for those of you who are not uh, uh, familiar with how numerical relativity has evolved in the last five or seven years, let me just give you a brief history in one slide. Okay? So after many years, decades of uh, effort in trying to solve the two-body problem in general relativity, that is the merging, the spiral and merger of two black holes, in my opinion, these three pieces of work basically opened the avenue, the, uh, opened the door. It's not that they they came up with the entire machinery of numerical relativity. They don't develop that, but they put all the pieces together that they were needed to do movies like this. Okay, and these movies are the result of simulations. There's actually data from the outcome of numerical relativity codes, and those three pieces of work is one of them by Frank Pretorius, and um, I think he was briefly a postdoc here before moving to uh, yeah, and. Uh, that was in 2005. That was a single person effort. Okay? And, and what he did is he managed to do one orbit or a little bit more than an orbit in spiral and merger of two black holes. And here is a snapshot of that simulation at that time. And uh, these are the years that the papers were published. But uh, uh, around 2005, the end, it was, I think, in October or November of 2005, Two independent groups, one led by Campanelli and Lusto at that time in Brownsville, and the other one by Baker and Centrella in uh, Goddard. Both of them they managed to put together, again, all these pieces that were around to be able to do simulations like this. And here are two snapshots of their simulations. This is by the group at that time in Brownsville, and this is the one in Goddard. And I'll tell you just a little bit more about that when it comes time to discuss about what is in our work with uh, black holes and gas clouds. But anyway, okay. since then, I mean, the, the, they had been, uh, it, the, the recipe was so robust that uh, in the span of months, groups were able to quickly change their codes and their infrastructure to be able to collide black holes. I mean, literally, months. I mean, we went to this meeting, I think it was in October, November. Our postdocs at that time took about two months to modify our code and to be able to do the first uh, uh, mergers and, and, uh, of, of black holes. So the, as I mentioned in the beginning, the driving force right now, the main driving force still is 
that we have a huge effort in gravitational wave physics to detect gravitational waves, as you know. Now, those, that data collected by interferometers like LIGO has the problem that is noise dominated. Okay? This is a cartoon that I grabbed, I don't remember where, but just to give you an idea that if the red is the noise, the signal will be buried somewhere there. And in order to guide the people who are in charge of doing the data analysis, in order to, for them to uh, see what they should be expecting from this, that signal, we need templates like this. That is, we need the waveform that, uh, of the gravitational waves that are produced in the merger, in the spiral merger and ring down of black holes, in order for the people who do the data analysis to be able to get things like this out of the noise. So it still is the case that without numerical relativity, okay, will be very difficult to detect and characterize the sources. Now, there are two flavors here. One of them, the detection act characterization. Okay? Perhaps for detection, you don't need perfect templates. But this you know, is debatable. We have here an expert on that. And uh, maybe he will say the opposite. But I believe that for detection, maybe you don't have to be, you don't have to have the German high quality building cars or things like that. You can know the Mexican one like I do, right? <laughs> All right, so, but for characterization, there are the problem there is that there are many parameters in the system. So there are degeneracies. Things can look one way and, and, they are all, and, and when they are really something else. For that one, we need not only high quality templates, but also we need many of them to be able to cover the parameter space. And here, Harold, for instance, is leading an effort to be able to create a template bank in the community to, be, to get, hopefully, at some point at this level. But we're very early on in these stages, OK? Now, so the black, binary black holes today, OK? And uh, in my opinion, and this is, this is uh, my point of view, is that now we have multiple codes with, multiple, with different approaches. And there is one step that we need to be sure we pass, which is that, that the results are right. You can do self-consistency checks. That is, you can go and without the need of any of your collaborators and other groups, you can check that your results are hopefully correct. But another one is you do comparisons with other groups. Okay? So, and that has the advantage that, as I mentioned, there are not everybody is doing the same following the same prescription to solve Einstein equations. So it would be very nice to have uh, to, to compare results to be able to check the accuracy. For instance, this is a, a waveform of the group Cornell Caltech. I suppose now you have to add CETA, then you know, CCC or C cube or something like that, and uh, in which they use a formulation of the Einstein equation that is called a harmonic one, that is close to the one that hopefully, if you still look at Landau and Lifshitz books, that you see there. And uh, a, a numerical method that is the pseudo-spectral method. There is a large uh, community that use what is called the BSSN. They're just uh, um, uh, Bonker, Shapiro, Shibata, Nakamura formulation. And we use finite differences. So this is another example. This is a waveform from the group in, here in Georgia Tech. So it is important to be able to uh, do collaborations to compare results and to be able to add uh, the, the data analysis people trust those results. Uh, we can go also beyond that comparisons. We can also compare with pseudo-analytic uh, uh, results from post-Newtonian. Okay. That one, you can use it two ways. I mean, in my opinion, you can use it early on. For instance, this is a waveform from the Albert Einstein Institute. The merger occurs somewhere here at zero. Okay, the in spiral, early part of the in spiral with post-Newtonian is done with this dashed line. Later on, you join that to the numerical relativity. The, the post-Newtonian breaks down. The numerical relativity can continue. But in my opinion, the post-Newtonian can be used two ways. One of them, if you put numerical relativity in the regime where post-Newtonian is valid, you can check that numerical relativity code is doing the right thing. Okay? Because we trust that post-Newtonian, 
could be valid very early on in it. So you can use that. The other one you can also use in, in this side here to also check where post-Newtonian, once that you had trust that the numerical relativity code do solve the correct problem, you can then check when things start diverging and when post-Newtonian breaks down. Or you can also do the thing to merge the two and to have a waveform that expands the whole area as well. So there are many things that you can do. The, the nice thing is that now the communities, both the data analysis, the analytics, so to speak, community by post-Newtonian, and the numerical relativity are working together. Examples of that are this NRAR. This is the one that uh, deals with numerical relativity and analytical relativity. There is this ninja that brings together data analysis and numerical relativity and all the community, the, 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 the main groups in, in numerical relativity are involved. All right. So let me just, before I talk to, uh, about the results that regarding the black holes in this gas cloud environment, one of the things that immediately, okay, immediately uh, people realize that with the tools of numerical relativity, you can go beyond the data analysis, the post-Newtonian collaborations, and so forth. And the first example was this of gravitational recoil. Okay? It's not that it wasn't known by them. They were already uh, uh, post-Newtonian and Newtonian uh, calculations that tells you that when two black holes unequal or with the spins in arbitrary orientations, when two black holes is spiral, okay, the gravitational radiation and all, uh, uh, the, the, the radiation of angular momentum and linear momentum is, is in such a way that it doesn't average out. Okay, and as they in spiral, the whole system wobbles a little bit and it keeps growing and growing until they merge and the signal shots. So you get a recoil in the direction opposite to where the gravitational uh, radiation was emitted, that the accumulation of that kick was emitted. And uh, with that, there were early work that dealt with uh, spins aligned with the orbital angular momentum, anti-line. You can get uh, kick velocities of a few hundred kilometers per second. Uh, Spare hack and collaborators, and also almost simultaneously later, uh, Campanelli and collaborators discovered this uh, uh, super kick that is about 2,400 kilometers per second, and it created a great excitement in the astrophysical community because this level of kicks will eject black holes from the cores of galaxies. And we know that almost there, you know, there are many, many galaxies, if not all, that have supermassive black holes. And it will be difficult to explain the existence of those black holes at the cores of the galaxies with kick velocities at this level. There have been many studies since then on how to get around that or how this type of kicks do not actually take place that often. Okay? So, but in addition, there has been a great body of work in which you can also look for electromagnetic signatures produced in the recoil of black hole. You can have things like uh, black holes that carry with it uh, the, the, a disk with it. You can have also the work by Anderson and collaborators in which they look about what is the changes that you have when you have that a reco uh, recoiling black hole that changes abruptly the gravitational gas uh, uh, gravitational potential that the gas uh, around it. So, there are many, many opportunities now using all these tools on American relativity to explore astrophysical problems. So this is just one of them, and it's just one slide that it definitely doesn't um, uh, cover all the, the examples. But what I want to focus the attention now is in supermassive black hole mergers. Okay? So the rest of the time, this is what I want to talk. We have very strong evidence that gal galaxies merge. Okay? And very often, as I mentioned before, they host a supermassive black hole. Therefore, it's natural to think that they will lead also to the merging and coalescence of supermassive black hole. This is one of the, the you know, poster child example of that, uh, of black holes that perhaps are in the process of merging there. Now, one of the challenges here, okay, one of the challenges here is that if we look at the scales, at the scales of, uh, uh, at which uh, galaxies merge, the, you know, hundreds of kiloparsecs, 
our uh, kiloparsec scales. And then the scales of the binary systems that are a few parsecs when they bind on even astronomical units near coalescence, then the question is how do black holes reach the gravitational wave in spiral regime? How do you go from this type of scale to scales that are much smaller than this in the, pro in the process when you have the two black holes already bound, orbiting, and hopefully even at the end uh, uh, emitting energy uh, through gravitational waves. So I think that it's fair to say that the answer will depend in, in big part in the, in the environment that, this, uh, the, that operates in those scales. So that is something that uh, we have to keep in mind when doing this modeling, okay? So let me just walk you through what uh, are in general the stages in the history of the merger of a supermassive black hole, binary black hole, in a gas-rich environment. And I'm going to just mostly follow the work by Colpi and collaborators. Here is a snapshot of those simulations to walk you through this history and then motivate where is where we start our simulations, okay? So the first one, of course, you have the two galactic cores, okay? Well, these are the two galaxies, but in the cores are there where my green dot is. And that galactic course, the potential well, drags with it the black holes, okay? Then let's say that we're thinking about, like this, in this simulation of the case in which each galaxy has about a million solar mass black hole, okay? So it's, or each of them are surrounded by a disk that is, uh, you know, a hundred times more massive than that, that each black hole. So we're talking about that. Uh, at this stage of the simulation, then the disk merge, okay, you form a disk that, uh, that then uh, the gas dynamical friction is the one that now helps to bring these two black holes to the center, but they're not bound yet, okay? The next stage, okay, the next stage, with now we're talking about the scales of a few parsec, is when the mass within the separation of the binary, when the mass enclosed at the, at the, uh, in a volume of comparable size to the separation of that is less than the mass of the binary, at that point is when you see that the black holes bind and they form a Keplerian binary. So what I have here on the left from the same work of Colpi and collaborators is a plot that shows the separation in parsecs, okay? as a function of time, and some snapshots here of the entire simulation. Notice here that it's about uh, around the five giga years, and these snapshots go cover a little bit more. This is 2.6 from the initial time, three, four, so it is in this part that this simulation, uh, and that, that this time uh, uh, the plot takes place. And that is in which you still have, okay, you still have these passages of these two black holes with disks around, and then eventually you can see that in this amount of time, you get the, the, the two black holes bind and settle down around a separation of a few parsecs, okay? The next stage, okay, when you go to subparsec scale, I mean, there you can have the three-body interactions, okay, with the surroundings that could also contribute to shrink the orbit of the black holes, okay? However, it's well known that uh, eventually you could run out of stars and uh, the reservoir of, of stars depletes and the shrinking due to this type of relaxation stops. And in the same work here, you have two situations. This is for a, uh, a mass ratio of one to four. At, uh, then you have two types of uh, simulation. One of them that is dry, okay, that it doesn't have gas, it only has particles that mimic the presence of the star, and you have 10% of gas shows, uh, the other, in another case. And you can start seeing a difference here of this, how the separation, here again, black hole distance in kiloparsecs as a function of time in giga years, you see that there is a difference at the late stages between the situation that you have a dry simulation and one with gas. It goes more dramatic when you increase when you increase the, the, the amount of gas, and it definitely here you see that you can reach a shorter uh, separation or a smaller distance between the black holes, 
as in the case of dry. So again, this is another indication that definitely the environment plays a role. Now, but there is still a huge distance in this case from the time in which you have that things operate due to three body uh, 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 scattering or by uh, gas dynamic dynamical friction and the area in which you get the coalescence driven by gravitational radiation. So this is a, a plot that uh, here is a semi-major axis, so let's just say the separation of the binary. This is the mass of the black holes involved. And depending on their masses, you will see that uh, the, 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 the place of the distance at which gravitational radiation takes over is different, but nonetheless, in each, in each case, there is a gap. And this is what is well, called the well-known uh, last parsec problem. That is how the black holes will shrink from this type of separations to the ones covered in blue, okay? So for that, there are different uh, ideas on that. The one that uh, I'm gonna just discuss here briefly is uh, the one in which uh, support by the results of quadrant collaborators that tells you that the shrinkage from here there all the way until gravity takes over is driven by, uh, 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 it's assisted, so, so to speak, by the presence of a disk and the torques that uh, are involved in, 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 uh, in this system of two black holes, or two, in this case, uh, uh, yeah, two black holes and, and the disk to be able to bring them together, okay? Now, this is more effective if you have unequal mass binaries, okay? And here is uh, a case of a ratio of one to three, and for different black holes, one is three, uh, three times 10 to the five, six, and seven. There's red, black, and blue. So the, the larger, uh, the, I'm sorry, the more massive the black hole, it takes a, you know, a little longer here in terms of the, the, the distance I need to start from. And what uh, the, this process here is the one that I uh, we were discussing before, and this is the effect, okay? This is the effect due to, to the presence of the disk. These dashed lines, okay, the dashed lines are the ones that you obtain, okay, by just considering this three-body relaxation thing, okay? So you need the gas to be able to bring things to scales a distance of you know, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus uh, uh, 3 parsecs. What is I'm sorry? What is OK, so here is the time scale, OK? And this is the separation. So it's kind of uh, uh, inverted in the, other, in the other way that I had. So this is the, initial, the, the separation of the binary, OK? And this is the time that it takes, given this process, to bring it down, OK? No, 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 because at this point, yes. But I mean, at this point, look at, uh, look at them. They cross over, and the time scale is much larger. So at this point, let's just take, for instance, uh, let's see. Let's just take, for instance, this one here, right? So the time scale here is much larger than the one that it will take by uh, the one with the disk. So at this point, it's more effective, though. OK? Let's see, if I remember correctly, the, the, the reason that, uh, let me, there was a, a transition from being dominated by the torques from, from the disk as opposed to just the dynamical gas friction on the, on the, on the or whatever in the, in the environment, okay? If I remember correctly. Okay. And the final one, okay, that is the one, you know, 10 to the minus 3. So we're, we're thinking in a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole. So we're in this case. So once that you reach this stage here, okay, that is the separation of 10 to the minus 3. That is when gravitational radiation takes over, okay. And you are at the stage in which you have the most luminous source of gravitational radiation with this order of magnitude type of uh, luminosity. And... The point that is uh, what the, the main motivation for the work here is that although we don't know exactly what will be the environment operating there, but it's expected there will be matter there, there will be gas, uh, 
So there is a chance that during coalescence, you can also have an electromagnetic signal uh, being produced. So this is one uh, example of a unique opportunity to do multi-messenger astrophysics driven by <laughs> electromagnetic and gravitational observations. Okay, so this synergy of electromagnetic and gravitational wave observations, this is just a probably very short list of things that, uh, that uh, one can hopefully get from those. It will improve sky localization. Hopefully it will also, with more with more uh, uh, information from electromagnetic observations, improve the, the, the rates of detection for gravitational wave experiments. The work by Scott Hughes and collaborators has already told us that those types of observations will help us to work with what is called uh, cosmological standard sirens, not candle sirens, because it's, uh, gravitational waves act more like sound than, than, than uh, they are more analog sound than electromagnetic waves. It could also tell us, these observations, it could also tell us about accretion processes near black holes and uh, even test for uh, uh, theories of gravity. Okay. Now, adding matter to the problem then. So what we have is that I hopefully uh, make a case that is interesting to study the merger of uh, black holes in the presence of matter. So I'll go through some of the work they have done in this direction. And one of them is, well, that uh, at the end, the goal is that for astrophysical relevant system, you have to model gas and magnetic fields in the dynamical space time of emerging black hole. What do I mean by that? Well, for these astrophysical relevant problems, the, whatever you put in the right-hand side of the, of the Einstein equation will not affect the dynamics of the black holes, believe me, okay? Unless you go way beyond things that are unrealistic. That is, you can put magnetic fields, you can put gas, anything else there. If you want to stay within the astrophysically relevant uh, situation, they are just fields or, or uh, uh, the, the matter and the, and the electromagnetic fields they are just doing their dynamics in the background provided by the black holes. But this background is a dynamical background. So, the bottom line is that in principle, you can do a black hole evolution, save the entire space time, save completely all the details that, tell, that allows you to reconstruct the, the space time, okay? And then run again your hydro, your electromagnetic, whatever you want, on top of that without having to solve the Einstein equations again. Okay. In principle, you can do that. Okay. So the simulations that we do, if I change a little bit what the matter content is, it will not affect at all what the black holes are doing. Okay. However, it okay, turns out that it's simpler to solve the entire problem than doing this and then solving again the matter problem on top of it. It's easier, believe it or not. Now we have gone from this situation in which now it's much more difficult to solve the matter content in your problem than the Einstein equations. The irony of the whole thing is that. Okay? Five years ago, you say, oh, solving the Einstein equations is such a complex. So I'm not saying that it's trivial, but right now from the computational point of view, it's better just to solve the two things together over and over. No matter that, the matter doesn't react back into the gravitational fields. Okay? Now, the first step, as it was taken by the group in uh, Goddard in, uh, in, uh, in NASA, is to say, well, let's start with test particles. So what they did is, let's just don't put the, any right hand side on the Einstein equations and solve just geodesics of test particles in this background. And mimic the collisions by every time the two particles get together at certain distance, they say, well, a collision has occurred, and from there they infer some energy, energy emitted or something like that. They start with 25,000 particles uniformly distributed with some velocity distribution. Here's an example of that. The two black holes is kind of a shell and uh, one of the important results in that, in that uh, study is that 
they detected something that looks like a flare. So this is the maximum Lorentz factor of all the, uh, in all the particles in the system. And it pretty much stays the same during the... And when the black holes are about to merge, which is at this point, they detect that some of the particles get a significant increase in their velocities. So what they uh, conclude is that the same thing will happen if you have a more realistic situation with gas and so forth. And it's not that surprising. You say, yeah, that's where you get the, 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 the black holes, the, pro, the, the, the potential is starts to be deeper. Yes? When, you, when they, the beginning conditions for the simulation, yes. how, how far is the inner edge of the particle dust from the black holes? Uh, this thing here? Yeah. OK, so uh, actually, here it shouldn't be that difficult to find, let's see, because this is minus 0.2, OK? So the separation is about uh, 7m. So I will say that it's about 3m, or you know, about 2 or 3 so, spatial radius. So would that mean, I would think, I mean, so this, this is just a few orbits before the merger of the halls. No, they went through several ones. I mean, they oh, were. Well, few, but I mean, I would have thought that uh, the disk couldn't catch up to the, the you know, at, at separations much wider than the, this separation of the black halls. The, the inspiral time due to gravitational radiation would have been short compared to the viscous time on which the disk could move inwards. So mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's not obvious to me that this is like a physical motion. I, 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 I will tend to agree with you, but uh, the, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, don't think, don't that, I think they have not tried to stimulate the gist in physical minor gist, but just some residual gas at this at the interior of the two black holes. It just somehow got there. Right. Okay, sure. Right. But. Uh, now, the, and, and most of these ejections, because I mean, since we did uh, not with particles, but with gas, and we can also, as I'll show, a similar plot on this, most of them obviously come from the, the very rapid uh, last few orbits that there is ejecting particles all, all over. Okay. All right, the other one that Carlos here uh, was involved is in the uh, supermassive black hole merges that are surrounded by electromagnetic fields. So this is not MHD. They solve Maxwell's equations with Einstein equations. And here's another example that uh, uh, even that everything is no approximations. Maxwell, Einstein system all together. Uh, you can see by calculating the ratio of the electromagnetic to the gravitational wave that is very little, okay? And you will have to pump the magnetic fields to a realistically high value to be able to make a difference on the dynamics. The frequencies are also a little bit too small. But they point out, and I think it's, it's very reasonable, that even if directly you cannot detect this such a thing, but it will have an indirect effect on the accretion rate. And you can, you can, uh, you can potentially see observable effects on this thing. Okay? But once again, I mean, unless Carlos disagrees, that you could perfectly do the GR and the magnetic fields later on, and it will not change it, as long as you stay in, in, in a reasonable values for magnetic fields. All right. So now the, guy, the ones are surrounded by gas. So we have uh, point particles, magnetic fields, now gas, OK? This, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, the work we did, but I had to point out that uh, it was uh, probably, I don't remember, it was a month later or so, a few weeks later, that the group in Illinois, led by Stu Shapiro, had a, a, a similar type of work. There is some significant overlap, and I'll tell you a little bit about the differences there as well. Okay, so what we have then is, as I mentioned, it's very difficult to know in detail, what is the environment operating in the vicinity of black hole at scales of you know, 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3 parsecs, which is the one that we're looking at. So what we did, in the absence of this knowledge, well, we say, OK, let's bracket the situations in two extremes. Okay? One of them is if you have a gas, a gas cloud in such a way that you have that cooling is inefficient, so the black holes are immersed in this pressure-supported cloud, geometrically thick, 
and so forth. The other one is the circumvener disk, like the one that Quadra and collaborators did. Okay? So we picked this just for simplicity. We're currently doing this. Okay? But we picked that one for simplicity. It's a, it's, it's a lot easier to implement the initial setup and so forth. But uh, uh, I think that there are some features that we expect to be common, some bold features, other ones there will be differences. So the idea here, and I will repeat that at the conclusion, is that uh, since we don't know exactly what is it, the best thing that we can do is to try different scenarios and detect characteristics that are common or quite distinct one from the other ones. So when the observation comes, we can, we can, we can uh, make a, a statement about which of the two or which area in between is what the observations are pointing to. All right, so, and this is what we did, okay? We put two black holes with separation of 8M that we pick a scale of 10 to the 7 solar mass black holes. That implies 10 to the minus 5 parsecs. And uh, the separation was only for practical purposes because now another thing is that now the expensive part of the calculations is not the GR, it's the hydro. The hydro is very expensive, so we cannot do all the series of runs that we were used to with black holes. Now it's, it's the hydro, okay? So we pick that, we pick a, a, a density that is a little bit in the highest side of that. It's a, it's a Gaussian profile, that the case. Now the reason that we pick a cloud is just because we wanted to, we were afraid of getting too close to the boundaries of the computational domain. But we have extended that, it doesn't make a difference. Actually, the, our fears were not well founded. We found that the code is capable to having even a completely uniform uh, density all the way to the outer boundary. There's no problem with that. It's just that we pick that, and again, the simulations are so expensive that doing them again, all of them will have been just too much. We have, as I mentioned before, we are of the camp that we do the BSSM form of the Einstein equations. We have four and six order accurate in the Einstein equations. We have less in the hydro. This, since we're not after, our focus is not the gravitational waveforms, this is not relevant in, the, in that sense. You have to control the hydro. We use uh, what is called cactus for parallelization, IO, and so forth. Carpet for AMR, although it's not the strictly speaking AMR, it's what is called fixed mesh refinement. What we did is to build our hydro code is to grab the public version of whiskey and just tie it to that, okay? Now, from here to the above, I mean, I like to emphasize that now you don't have to be, you know, 10 or 20 years experience in numerical relativity to build your own code. You can, this is publicly available. You can go on and grab it spend a few times talking to Harold, I, I hope, or, or, or Carlos, and they will, you can put together your own binary black hole. The part that is proprietary to each group, and that's the one that is more difficult for you to grab, is everything that involves in analysis tools for your simulations, like tracking horizons, spins, and so forth. Okay, so this is the, 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 the runs, that, these are the runs that we did. They are the spins of the black hole. We kept them aligned with the angular momentum of the, of the orbital angular momentum of the binary. The only reason doing that is because, because of the symmetry, we save computational resources and we're able to do more runs. That's it. We're now doing arbitrary runs, but they take a lot longer, okay? Uh, and also we kept the same masses to be able also to take advantage of that symmetry, okay? Just to give you an idea, a run like this with the hydro and everything, I don't remember how many cores we use and everything, it takes uh, roughly a week and a half, okay? The runs that we're currently doing with arbitrary spins and mass ratio of one to three, I believe, okay? It has been already running for two weeks and it's not done. I wanted to have it done for this talk and it, they are not done. So it's, the hydro is a killer for us, anyway. And um, so these are some of the uh, assumptions and, and things that we don't have yet in there. Okay, so here are two movies, okay? One of them is the case in which two, the two black holes are aligned. This is the magnitude, they're both aligned with the, with the orbital angular momentum. This is one in which the spin magnitude is a little bit 
less, but one of them is pointing down, okay? So these two here, the spins are pointing away from the screen, and in this case, this one here, the positive one is pointing down into the screen. The, there is a slight difference, okay? And uh, one of the things that one needs to be careful is to make statements about the early part of the evolution, okay? The early part of the evolution is highly contaminated, so to speak, by the initial conditions that are definitely not astrophysical because we have a cloud that has that profile, is not rotating, and so forth. We just pick that for simplicity. So in the same way that even in the vacuum case, you have to wait until this junk radiation flushes out of the system. In this case, it's not that the, 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 the junk initial conditions are going to flush away. That is, that, that's not what it happens in, in, in the fluid. But at least that the, that the fluid knows about the presence of the binary that is orbiting and that is doing the, adapting to the potential wells of those. So now, you can see that since both of them are now at different stages of the merger, I'm going around and, and around it, and do this. this here merged, okay, a little bit later than this one here, okay, because the, the, this hung up uh, 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 process that Campanelli point, and, and collaborators pointed out, that is that this has larger initial total angular momentum so it has to shed more angular momentum before merger. And this one it's already has a little less because the total angular momentum from the spins is zero. Okay? All right. So I'll come back into this. And, uh, but you can see that after they merge, they, it accretes all the junk, and then it reaches some sort of a steady state uh, uh, case. Are you doing body no, we're not doing, uh, no, at that point they are, they are doing it. But initially we didn't set up things as a uh, body uh, hole accretion. That was Shapiro who did that. So okay. you're not doing that. So uh, how are they accreting? What is your accretion prescription? No, we don't have a prescription. I mean, we just measure the accretion. I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll, yeah. Okay. Have so. You, have you actually tested and evolved how the final distribution of gas depends on the initial gas? I'll talk, I'll, I have a slide about that. Okay. So. Here, what we did is, because we were interested in looking at the presence of shocks, we just put contours uh, of uh, places in which the Mach number is uh, larger than one. This is for the case that was in the left panel, that is two pointing up. And um, here's the scale from one to five. The areas in white are the ones that are below one, okay? So it is in these places, hopefully, where we expect uh, uh, you know, shocks will, will develop, okay? And uh, just to give you a sense of what type of luminosity you'll be getting, so what we did is the following, okay? We, when we were trying to figure out what, uh, what type of luminosity to report, we calculated the scales, and we found out that if we make an assumption that the type of magnetic fields, we just don't know, in that neighborhood of the order of one Gauss, okay, we will be dominated by Bram Strahlen. And synchrotron will be of this order, okay? Remember, the only thing that we evolve is density and specific internal energy. So from that, depending on what, how you play this game about the magnetic fields and so forth, is what uh, you will emphasize one or the other. This one corresponds to, it will be then, let's see, equipartition is 10 to the 4. Okay? All right. So Shapiro, that's what he did. It is just one order of magnitude below equipartition. And with that one, and with other assumptions that he had, for him is synchrotron. So I don't see here a point of argument one or the other one, because we, both simulations do basically the same thing and calculate densities and internal energy and so forth. It depends on how you play this game, okay? Now also, you can play the game with this. I mean, he assumed that most of the, the emission comes from a much smaller area than us. And, but that one you can measure, hopefully, and so forth, okay? Now, um, a point that uh, has been brought to us is about the optical depth. 
we went back and uh, did identified the areas of which the emission comes from, and we now agree with uh, with uh, Stu that is probably a little bit smaller, and then the area that is outside, okay, in that area that is outside, you have that the optical depth is below one. It's just in those hot spots in the immediate vicinity, as he pointed out, or the group in Japan, that is where you're coming, uh, you, you, you're getting the most of the emission, okay? So what we ca calculate with the vicinity, here are the two movies, it's the same thing, these are the align and this is the anti-align, okay? Here we go. Again, this early part should not be trusted from the astrophysical point of view. Now, ones that, ones that you see some sort of a cell-similar type of picture, then you can think that the system has adjusted to, to, to the presence, I mean, that the cloud has adjusted to the presence of the black holes. And here again, most of it comes from this tiny region there, okay? And uh, notice that at the end, there is a bar form that if I were to put the pictures from uh, the, the Colpi simulations of Mayer, that it is natural to think that as the two black holes come together, there is going to be also some sort of a potential well that is a, a bar along this thing, and that also is where uh, a significant fraction of the emissivity co uh, emission comes from. Okay? So right now, this is mostly concentrated around the black holes, and you will see that a bar forms there, and that comes back into this flare business that I uh, talked about from the group of Centrella and, uh, and Goddard. Okay, so if you then put the two together, the, the Mach wave moment and the Bragg's travel emission, and of course there is, there is a correlation of the two, okay? Not surprising, okay? But let me go in a little bit more detail about this brain straddle on luminosity. So what we did then, we integrated the emissivity, the same thing also Shapiro did. Uh, two cases, one in which you took about, uh, we, uh, the, the blue one took, took into consideration Doppler uh, beaming and, uh, and the red one not. Uh, what we did is zero is the point at which the black holes are, are are merging. So this drop here is when the black holes have merged, okay? Then from here is the early part. We have chopped anything before this because that was with all these initial conditions that we detected will not uh, be astrophysically relevant. So what we see is that of decay, okay? And if this part is where that bar forms, okay? This part here, and I'm gonna run the movie so you can, this part here is when the bar forms, as soon as they go, the signal shuts off. If there is some anisotropy surrounded, this is the period of time in which they will get accreted, and then you enter this steady state uh, accretion. This here, again, okay? If you believe that there is still feeding gas, and all that, you should not probably pay too much attention to that. This one here? This one here. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so let me, so you cannot read the numbers, but right now we are at, at, at uh, we're about entering, right here is where we're entering this stage, okay? You have to leave one and a half orbit to go by, okay? Then it is when you start seeing this, this bridge form and then the signal shots, you get a little bit of, uh, of uh, anisotropies, or you know, this inhomogeneity is being accreted. At this point, it's still going, the simulation is still going, now you're reaching this. Yes? How much mass is that in gas? I'll, I'll, I'll come back in a sec. Okay, here are the different cases, okay? All right, here are the different cases. If you have zero spins, if this, as soon as the black holes merge, okay, then you enter this steady state thing. They have not created enough 
disturbances to be able to have still something. The same thing happens with the cases in which uh, point four, the spins are not high enough to stir the, the gas around. This is the first one in which you start it still, as you evolve, you create this mess that it accretes, so you have blows falling up. So my, my uh, 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 conclusion on this is that if we were to have this, okay, a much larger separation, and give enough time for the black holes to create this mess around, you can still get something like this. It's just that the spins help to accelerate creating these disturbances in the gas. And this is the case in which you have the two, one up and one down, and because of the uh, asymmetries, you naturally create all this a little bit more of a mess, and it takes longer to enter this stage here. Okay? So what we're doing now to prove this is that now we're also doing a cloud that is not homogeneous. It has blobs around to demonstrate the case that this is an artifact of having this, you know, uh, this cloud that is uh, maybe too simplistic in that, in that sense. Okay, going back to the maximum Lorentz factor, okay. So here is a plot that I showed before. They have three cases, an isolated non-rotating cloud, a non-rotating, and uh, uh, five orbits to merger. This is how it looks, uh, five and then you have this non-rotating five order, uh, and this is a rotating class five order to merger, okay. So it's not that you can do a direct comparison with this, but what we did is we also calculate the maximum Lorentz factor of the fluid there. And you could, in principle, so here is where the merger occurs. So you can, in, in this case, something that looks like this, okay. That is, the, and it's not surprising again, the fluid will move much faster when you're in the last stages when, all, when, the, when the, the black hole is about to merge. But that doesn't mean that it's always this an indication that, you're, that it's where the merger. You can have other ones here, okay? The way that the black hole now are plowing through the gas, there is gas falling in. So I think that it's, 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 it's difficult especially if you have this case that is a G2, which is a high spin that they, they produce more turbulence in the, in the gas, it will be difficult to distinguish this as a unique signature. Here again, is because the black holes have anti-line, they merge very quickly, and indeed the most dramatic part of the merger is near the point of coalescence, okay? So I don't think that, uh, I think for us, it's still open the question that a flare of this kind will be an indication of the merger. You can have things going on a little bit earlier if you just look at the maximum Lorentz factor. After the merger, you get a high Lorentz factor, gas falling the Yeah, actually, that's a good point. I mean, you see here that there you still have Lorentz factors above one, okay? That it, but, but that is just the steady accretion that you get into the black hole. And they're different for all different cases, right? Um, they are, that's right, because uh, actually, very good. You see how the Lorentz factor depends on the final spin. Each black hole will have a different final spin. Accretion, okay? So what we did is, and that is the advantage of having all this machinery from American relativity because we can go, we know where the horizon is, the apparent horizon, and we can calculate the, the, the accretion rate through that membrane, period. So that's what we have here. What we have here is for the case in which they have two align up high spin, so to speak, we have the accretion rate when you add one black hole and the other, here are the two independent, and of course it's the same. The both black holes have the same mass, the same spins. So there are two lines here, both of them identical. This is the point in which they merge, okay? So the idea is that this plus this gives the... This, do you, are the things are moving on, sorry, uh, on timeline GD6? Hey, it doesn't look like there's a lot of plunging going on. Like, you think inside the ISCO things would be plunging right into the horizon. But if you look at those lines, it doesn't quite look like that. I guess. Uh, I'm sorry. I was just wondering about, I mean, 
the, the, the particles are moving on. It's a fluid, right? It's it's a, it's a gas fluid. But, you, but they're moving on. They're moving on GUDs. No, they are pressure forces, right? Okay. Yeah. Now this is not like the centrella calculation. This this it has hydrodynamic force forces on it. So. Okay. Sorry. sorry. This, this is bonding oil. Yeah. All right, and then this is for the case in which one spin is up and one is down. Not surprising, when they are far apart, the accretion is the same. They have, the spins have no head chance to see and uh, uh, to affect it. But at some point, about 100 m before the merger, then uh, you get uh, you get uh, a significantly less accretion from the spinning opposite to the orbital angular momentum. And not significant, just a little more. Okay. So there are differences in the accretion. And, yes? But why is the, is the accretion rate plunging because the amount of matter being supplied? No, 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 no. And I'm, actually, I'm glad that you asked that because this thing here is the trickiest part of the calculation. And let me tell you why. You go from the situation in which you had two black holes to one, okay? Where did you call one and where you call two when they're in the process of merging? And since you're calculating things that go through membranes, it makes a huge difference, okay? So what we have is, you have, we're following two horizons, and eventually there is one that pops out that when you start taking over the calculation to do the accretion. If you are not careful about trying to approach one from the left, one from the right to see how, how, how they match, you will, you will think that there is a, 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 an abrupt jump. So how we did this, if you want, so we got as close as possible to the left while still having one black hole, and then we kept the other ones one as well. So I will not trust this drop. What I think, the, if you want to be, you know, uh, I mean, if you want to do it, you have to extrapolate this, and that's how you join it. But we just couldn't. It's very difficult, that part of the calculation, and it's only a few M there where you have the two black holes, one of them popping out and the other one. Yeah. Exactly. 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 So. Oh, 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 oh! I thought that you were talking about this part here. And the, well, no. Okay. Yeah. No. Shapiro's curves are different just because of that. They have the same accretion, and since they are doing bonding bon, uh, bon hole, they definitely get it dif they, the different way. So, so your decrease in m dot over the over your simulation is, is indicative of the loss of gas off the grid. Right. I mean, that, 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 and actually, this is this is what you want to to see. Okay. So, this is what we did is we put a single black hole. Okay, single black hole in the same cloud. This is what you get. No surprising, right? You will, because we have this Gaussian profile cloud, this is what you get. Okay, all of these other curves, okay, are the ones of accretion in this, in this, in this, uh, we rescale because all the scales are different because all the values. So, even though we put here T, this T is only for the solid line, the other curves were rescaled so you are able to see which things are indicative to, and now you can see that early on, okay, indeed, you get the same thing as, as a single black holes, two black holes, we added it, and all the way to the end, all of them converge to the one of the single one, okay? That's why we, we want to emphasize that in this case, if there is anything that you want to give you the benefit of the doubt that is interesting, is this part here, and this is indicative of the setup, okay? All right, last slide. We look at uh, superimpose those oscillations on the luminosity, on the gravitational waves. 
the preliminary distance, we just took the, because it's in logarithmic scale. And not surprisingly, the, 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 the oscillations due to Doppler beaming are associated also with the uh, uh, gravitational waves because it's all due to the orbital motion of that. Here's a case of two up and with a spin a little bit lower. So now, you will ask, okay, this is looking at the binary from the top, which is the best situation that you can have there. The luminosity oscillations are using it this way here. Okay, it's not being seen in the same direction. Huh? They just make the point that there is this correlation on that. They, obviously, if you want to, if you believe in this, if you want to see both, the best thing will be an angle in between. Okay. All right. Then let me just a slide of uh, Shapiro just to make the point. Given what they picked, again, they they pick uh, uh, this type of accretion. Given what they pick, the masses of the black hole, the densities that they use, and the, and the emphasis on the magnetic fields, their conclusion was that it was synchrotron radiation. For this type of binary, they detect uh, uh, luminosities of this order in, in, in synchrotron, and they say that it could be visible in, uh, and that it's in the visible band. So, to end, okay, so, uh, we conclude that they could have similar properties as uh, low luminosity AGNs. There is a correlation on some variability, but this is still open the question if for more realistic situations, you will see this. For instance, right now we're doing arbitrary spin on equal mass and to see if this survives, okay? Then uh, the, we conclude also that the most massive uh, list of binaries will, could be visible on to, uh, to redshift uh, of one. And, uh, and then we need more follow-up work. And that follow-up work means to explore different setups for the gas. And we're in the process of adding magnetic fields and see if we can detect also uh, differences in, or, or different uh, signatures when we add magnetic fields. Thank you. Well, this, if you want to, this type of luminosity was to some extent by construction, okay? In the same way that Shapiro picked another set of parameters to be able to emphasize another ones, his are a little lower. I mean, if I, if, if I, uh, in, the, in the new runs, we had decreased the density of the, we have, brought the densities down a little bit more to what Shapiro has, okay? As a consequence, then you have more room with this, but also you are able to be more comparable to synchrotron, okay? So I, I don't know if I will put too much emphasis to that, but yes. Okay, that was also an educated guess, okay? that the, the temperature that we get from the protons is uh, about an order of magnitude higher, and we assume that it was a... Uh, the perfect temperature between the solid system and the high row. I'm sorry? The perfect temperature is between the solid system and the high row. Yes, yes, yes. And you're just scaling the... Yeah, we scale it down. Yeah, we scale it by an order of magnitude. Yeah. And uh, so that's... that. Also, you know, you can play with this thing here, but... I mean, I think the way that Shapiro did it is probably more self-consistent. He actually did a proper integration to get the luminosity. And, and not only that, he did the, the, not the back of the envelope thing that we did, but he did a proper redshift in of quantities to infinity so he can get everything accounted for. But I will say that the, the, the overall results are, are, are very similar, and it just depends on... Like it happens with it, it depends on how you trick the, the, the things. So yeah. On that slide, the two simple radiations from the point of the 
And the last slide? No, on the back. Where is that you just scored? Yeah. We find precisely the same symbol on radiation. A uh, modulo that attended with three different difference in magnetic field at the end. Is this a coincidence or is this? No, no actually, theirs are, are a little lower. I'm not quoting. Sorry, I shouldn't have put Ferris there thinking that this is their number. So what I did is I graphed the, what they did, rescale it to their value to show that ours, yeah, I need to be a little more careful. No, they, uh, theirs is, they are even a little bit lower than this, 10 to the 40 or so. Okay.